Can I invite you uh, to uh, open your Bibles, actually, uh, to Matthew 22. I want to read uh, the first 14 verses of Matthew 22, right at the outset of uh, my speech. Uh, you'll see that the speech is uh, titled, Dort's Unfeigned Call of the Gospel. Uh, as you probably be aware, the uh, word unfeigned is not one that we use all that much uh, today, but unfeigned means seriously. And so, in fact, the paper could actually be entitled or titled Dort's Serious Call of the Gospel. And the reason I would like to read Matthew 22 and the first 14 verses is because there in the parable of the a great feast, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ sets forth uh, the fundamental truths concerning uh, the proclamation of the gospel. And though our focus will be upon the canons itself, uh, we all realise that the background to the canons and the basis of the canons is in fact uh, the word of God. We read there, And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready, come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants, and entreated them spitefully, and slew them. But when the king, the king thereof uh, heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies, and destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see, this, to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment, and he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Find him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen." It's interesting, without uh, entering into an explanation of that uh, parable, that that parable is clearly about uh, the subject of the call of the gospel. It's not altogether apparent on the face of the uh, parable, perhaps in a certain way, uh, but it becomes more apparent when you realise that the words, uh, for example, that are translated bidden and bid in that passage all come from the Greek word which fundamentally means to call. And so, for example, in verse 4, again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, tell them which are called. Behold, I have prepared my dinner. And so that parable, that parable uh, is directly on point, really, with the matter or the subject matter uh, that we are going to consider uh, here this morning. The paper takes its focus or takes its starting point uh, from the controversy that surrounded the call of the gospel as found in the canons. At the heart of that controversy uh, lies the issue as to whether the call of the gospel is expressive of a desire on the part of God for the salvation of all who come under the preaching of the gospel. And the way I propose to deal with this subject is this. Uh, firstly, I want to look at the controversy involving 
the call of the gospel. Secondly, I want to look at the battle for confessional support uh, in relation to that issue, and I want to uh, take up three examples of that. And then thirdly, I want to look at the remonstrant's uh, view of the call of the gospel. And then finally, to look at the call of the gospel as it's enunciated in the canons and the implications of that. This doctrinal controversy has a long history and it's one with which the Protestant Reformed Churches in particular are particularly au fait with. It goes by the names of the well-meant offer of the gospel, the sincere offer of the gospel, the free offer of the gospel, the gracious offer of the gospel. Now all four terms refer essentially to the same thing. The terms well-meant offer and sincere offer are intended by those who utilise those terms to emphasise God's sincerity in offering salvation to all who hear the gospel. And moreover, they also use those terms to indicate God's apparent earnest desire to save all that come under the preaching of the gospel. The term free offer is intended to emphasise that the external call of the gospel is unrestricted in its scope, salvation being graciously offered to all who hear the gospel. And then finally, the term gracious offer is designed to reflect that God has an attitude of favour toward all men in the preaching of the gospel. It's my intention in the course of uh, my address to use the term, uh, the well-meant offer of the gospel. What is the well-meant offer of the gospel? The proponents of the well-meant offer maintain that in the preaching of the gospel, God evidences an earnest and sincere desire to save all that come under the preaching of that word. They contend that the preaching of the gospel is an offer or an invitation of salvation to all, an offer of, or invitation of salvation to both the elect and to the reprobate, God calling upon and inviting men to repent and believe on Jesus Christ so that they might receive the benefits and blessings of salvation. Behind this offer of invitation, it's contended that there lies an earnest desire or intention on the part of God that his offer or invitation of salvation would be accepted by all who hear it. In other words, in the offer or invitation of the gospel itself, it is contended that there can be seen an expression of God's love for every sinner, though even those that propound the well-meant offer of the gospel admit that this is not a saving love because not every man, woman and child who even hears the gospel actually come to faith and salvation in Jesus Christ. To give you an indication of uh, how those proponents of the well-meant offer style that offer, uh, I've taken a, an excerpt from the writings of Morris Roberts. But Morris Roberts may not be so familiar to you, but Morris Roberts is familiar to Presbyterians because Morris Roberts uh, arises out of the United Kingdom and particularly he, has been, he was instrumental in the establishment of the Free Church of Scotland uh, continuing. Morris Roberts uh, defines the well-meant or free offer in this way. He defines it as the invitation given by a Christian preacher to all sinners to believe in Jesus Christ with the promise added that if they do believe, they will receive at once forgiveness of all sins and eternal life. Implied in the concept of this free offer are these ideas. The offer 
the offer made is for all who hear it, whether they be elect or not. And the offer is not to be restricted or modified by the preacher in his presentation. The offer, furthermore, he says, is an expression of love and grace on God's part towards sinful, unbelieving men. The offer is sincere on God's part and is genuinely well meant. The offer is addressed to sinners as they are and requires of them repentance and faith. To gain further understanding and appreciation of what is meant uh, by the well-meant offer, it's also worth uh, noting some of the comments that John Murray and Ned uh, Stonehouse made in their report to the 15th General Assembly of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church in 1948. Again, perhaps uh, John Murray and Ned Stonehouse are not so familiar to you, but they are significant in the history of Presbyterianism, certainly here in the United States. John Murray was the Professor of Systematic Theology at Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia from 1937 through 1966, and Ned Stonehouse, interesting, I was reading recently, but actually, Ned Stonehouse was actually born here in Grand Rapids. But Grand Rap uh, Ned Stonehouse was also a professor in uh, Westminster. He was professor of New Testament at that uh, seminary. He uh, held that position from 1929 to 1962. They wrote in a report, a majority report, uh, for the... Uh, Orthodox Presbyterian Church this. The question then is, what is implicit in or lies back of the full and free offer of the gospel to all without distinction? The word desire, they said, has come to be used in the debate, not because it is necessarily the most accurate or felicitous word, but because it serves to set forth quite sharply a certain implication of the full and free offer of the gospel to all. This implication is that in the free offer there is expressed not simply the bare perceptive will of God, but the disposition of loving kindness on the part of God, pointing to the salvation to be gained through compliance with the overtures of gospel grace. In other words, the gospel is not simply an offer or invitation, but also implies that God delights that those to whom the offer comes would enjoy what is offered in all its fullness. And they go on to say, again, the expression God desires in the formula that crystallises the crux of the question is intended to notify not at all the seeming attitude of God, but a real attitude, a real disposition of loving kindness inherent in the free offer to all. In other words, a pleasure or delight in God contemplating the blessed result to be achieved by compliance with the overture proffered and the invitation given. Murray and Stonehouse conclude in that report these things. There is in God a benevolent loving kindness towards the repentance and salvation of even those whom he has not decreed to save. This pleasure, will, desire is expressed in the universal call to repentance. The full and free offer of the gospel is a grace bestowed upon all. Such grace is necessarily a manifestation of love or loving kindness in the heart of God. And this loving kindness is revealed to be of a character or kind that is correspondent with the grace bestowed. The grace offered is nothing less than salvation in its richness and fullness. The love or loving kindness that lies back of that offer is not anything less, it is the will to that salvation. In other words, it is Christ in all the glory of his person and in all the perfection of his finished work, 
whom God offers in the gospel. The loving and benevolent will that is the source of that offer and that grounds its veracity and reality is the will to the possession of Christ and the enjoyment of the salvation that resides in him. To summarise the fundamental issues that are raised by the well meant offer, one might put forward these propositions. The well meant offer involves the question as to whether the preaching of the gospel is expressive of the will of God to save all those who hear it. It is also involves the question as to whether the preaching of the gospel is to be viewed as an expression of God's love and sincere desire for the salvation of all men. And it also involves the question as to whether in the preaching of the gospel, God graciously invites all men to repent and believe on Jesus Christ in order that they might attain unto salvation. Now those propositions are broad, broadly held in the church, the church world today. Uh, if you go to many of the mainstream churches today, uh, they would readily answer yes to all of those propositions that I've just enunciated. They would say, yes, the preaching of the gospel is expressive of the will of God to save all those that hear it. Yes, the preaching of the gospel is to be viewed as an expression of God's love and sincere desire for the salvation of all men. Yes, in the preaching of the gospel, God graciously invites all men to repent and believe on Jesus Christ in order that they might attain unto salvation. This is an ongoing battle in the church world today. It's an ongoing battle that the Protestant Reformed churches have been fighting since its inception. This is a battle also that the Evangelical Presbyterian Church of Australia has been battling. But the reality, brethren, is that we are few in number that reject the well meant offer of the gospel. Indeed, within Presbyterian and Reformed circles, there has been and is an ongoing struggle over this matter. And the struggle pertains to whether or not one is orthodox or heterodox. At the heart of that struggle for those churches such as yourselves that hold to the three forms of unity, the question arises is whether there is confessional support for the well met offer to be found in the canons of Dort. The all-important questions are these. What do the canons of Dort have to say, if anything, on the call of the gospel? Can the canons be called in aid of the well-made offer of the gospel? Do the canons support the notion that there is in God a desire for the salvation of all men? And does that desire come to expression in the preaching of the gospel? you'd all well understand that the stakes here are extraordinarily high. The prize is reformed orthodoxy. Do we actually hold and maintain our confessional standards? Or have we as churches become aberrant in the sense that we hold to a doctrine that is actually not supported by the confessional standards that, that we hold as churches. Uh, for you, those uh, standards are the three forms of unity. Uh, for myself, it's the Westminster confessional standards. But this issue is a very real issue, uh, both for yourself and for myself, because the views of the uh, church world are opposed uh, to an understanding of the confessional standards that would see a rejection of the well-meant offer 
of the gospel. As regards the canons, uh, what I've done is I've identified a number of examples that illustrate the nature of the warfare uh, that you as churches are involved in, which also really reflects the warfare that is involved too for Presbyterian churches also that reject uh, the well-meant offer of the gospel. In many ways, this is a continuation of the warfare that uh, Reverend Heisinger uh, mentioned in his speech. You'd be well aware that in 1924, the controversies that led to the formation of the Protestant Reformed churches revolved around the doctrine of common grace. However, embedded within the Christian Reformed Church's support for common grace was an adoption of the well-meant offer of the gospel. In the first of the three doctrinal statements approved by the Synod of the Christian Reformed Church in 1924, reference is actually made to the well-meant offer and an appeal, noticeably, is also made to the canons in support. This is the first point of uh, common grace with which you'd be well familiar. Notice what it says. It says, concerning the first point with regard to the favourable, favourable disposition of God toward mankind in general, and not only to the elect, Synod declares that according to the scripture and confessions, it is determined that besides the saving grace of God, shown only to the elect unto eternal life, there is a certain kind of favour or grace of God which he bestows to his creatures in general. This is evidenced by the quoted scripture passages and from the canons of Dort 2, 5, 3, 4, 8 and 9, which deals, notice this, with the general offer of the gospel. Whereas the quoted declarations of the Reformed writers from the golden age of Reformed Reformed theology also give evidence that our Reformed fathers from of old have advocated these opinions. So there the Synod of the Christian Reformed Church back in 1924 is actually appealing to Canons 2.5 and head three, four, and six, articles eight and nine in support of the general or the free offer of the gospel. The Christian Reformed Church, of course, at that time maintained that those three points that they adopted in 1924 contained nothing new, but were merely further interpretations of what was clearly implied or expressed in the forms of unity. In other words, they were saying that these things that they were asserting were to be actually found in your confessional standards and in the canons itself. Professor Lewis Burkhoff, who was the professor in Calvin Seminary from 1906 to 1944, referring to the three points, declared this. In the first place, we would call attention to the fact that in these points we have no material addition to our confessional standards. Our people may be assured that the Synod of 1924, by adopting the three points, added nothing to the essential contents of our confessions. She only brought forward and formulated a triplet of truths that are clearly implied in our confessional standards and that are partly emphatically expressed therein. So that's the first example that I'd uh, set forth before you of an example of a professedly reformed church uh, that has three forms of unity as its standards, appealing to the canons in support of the well-meant offer of the gospel. And the second illustration, in a way, flows on from that first. And that second illustration, which is more recent, is afforded by Professor Anthony Hookemer. Anthony Hookemer was Professor of Systematic Theology at Calvin 
from 1913 to 1988. And in his book, Saved by Grace, Hookema, under the heading, The Gospel Call is Seriously Meant, lends his support to the well-meant offer. And this is what he says. The Christian Reformed Church of North America maintains, in agreement with the majority of Reformed theologians, that the preaching of the gospel is a well-meant offer of salvation, not just on the part of the preacher, but on God's part as well to all who hear it, and that God graciously and earnestly desires the salvation of all to whom the gospel comes. And so we seem to be having just a little bit of trouble with the uh, projection. Uh, having made uh, known uh, his views on the well meant offer, you find that in his uh, book, Hookham then goes on to also appeal to Canons 2.5 and 348 uh, and references them as support for his understanding of the uh, free offer of the gospel. And interestingly, having made those references, we find that Hukama then proceeds to place into the mouths of the divines of Dort his own interpretation of what they were saying uh, to the remonstrants. And this is what he says. He says, in reply to what the Arminians had said, the theologian de Dort stated, we quite agree with you that God seriously, earnestly and unhypocritically and most genuinely calls to salvation all to whom the gospel comes. In stating this, we even use the very same words you used in your document, Syrio vacanta, are seriously called but we insist that we can hold to this well-meant gospel call while at the same time maintaining the doctrines of election and limited or definite atonement. We do not feel the need for rejecting the doctrine of election and repudiating the teaching of definite atonement in order to affirm the well-meant gospel call. Significantly, Hukama goes on to say with respect to the call of the gospel, the gospel call can be defined as follows. The offering of salvation in Christ to people together with an invitation to accept Christ in repentance and faith in order that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And Hukuma then in his work goes on then to identify and distinguish three elements that combine to make up the call of the gospel. Uh, firstly, he says, there must be a presentation of the facts of the gospel and of the way of salvation. The work of Christ has done for our salvation, or the work rather Christ has done for our salvation, must be clearly and carefully set forth. Secondly, he says that the, the gospel call must include an invitation to come to Christ in repentance and faith. The gospel call must be more than a presentation. It must include an earnest invitation. Jesus himself invites people to come to him in repentance and faith. And then quotes from Matthew 11 and verse 28. And then Hukuma goes on to rightly, and I would say significantly, observe this. The gospel invitation is, however, at the same time a command, like a summons which comes from a king. Note how Jesus expresses this point in the parable of the great banquet. And the Lord said unto the servant, go out unto, into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled, quoting from Luke 14, 23. The gospel invitation is not one a person may feel free to accept or decline as one might with an invitation to go bowling, but it is an order from the sovereign Lord 
of all creation to come to him for salvation and order that can be ignored only at the cost of one's eternal perdition. And you might listen to that and you might think, well, that's, uh, that's quite sound. And in many ways it is sound. But it's interesting that notwithstanding his identification of that as an aspect of the core of the gospel, uh, Anthony Hookemer uh, was comfortable in supporting the well-meant offer of the gospel. He concludes his uh, third point as regards the contents of the gospel by saying that the gospel call must also, and you'll recognise here really also the, really the words of the canon, he says it must also include a promise of forgiveness and salvation. The gospel call must also include the promise that those who respond properly to this call will receive the forgiveness of sins and eternal life in fellowship with Christ. This promise is, he says, however, conditional. You will receive forgiveness and salvation if you repent and believe. And so that's the second illustration I've placed before you this morning, uh, the, the illustration of Anthony Hookerman. The third illustration that I want to set before you uh, this morning is one that's provided uh, by Dr. Joel Beakey. Uh, Dr. Joel Beakey, as uh, many would be aware, is the president and professor of systematic theology and homiletics at the Puritan Reformed Seminary here in Grand Rapids, and he is a pastor of the Heritage Netherlands Reformed Church, also here in Grand Rapids. And in two recently published books uh, by uh, Dr. Beakey, he makes reference uh, to the subject of the well man offer. The two books in question are firstly Reformed Preaching, Proclaiming God's Word from the Heart of the Preacher to the Heart of His People, and the second is a book titled A Puritan Theology. And in both those books, uh, Dr. Beakey draws on different articles in the canons uh, to support the well man offer of the Gospel. In his book Reformed Preaching, uh, writing under the heading Preaching Makes a Sincere Offer of Christ to All Men, uh, this is what Dr. Beakey says. He says, God's election remains a secret until it bears fruit in conversion. Therefore, the preacher must proclaim the gospel to all who hear him. The canons read, and he's quoting here from Canons 2.5, Moreover, the promise of the gospel is that whosoever believeth in Christ crucified shall not perish, but have everlasting life. This promise, together with the command to repent and believe, ought to be declared and published to all nations and to all persons promiscuously and without distinction to whom God, out of his good pleasure, sends the gospel. He then goes on to say, the phrase promiscuously and without distinction is a pleonasm. A pleonasm is the use of more words than are necessary to convey a meaning. He says, the phrase promiscuously and without distinction is a pleonasm, meaning the gospel is to be proclaimed to any person and to all alike and applies to both the promise and the command of the gospel. It's interesting again there, notice that he also picks up, uh, as we'll come to see, the actual words of the canons. It's not as though he's ignorant of the fact that the canons maintain that the offer of the gospel is a, a, contains a promise and a command. Uh, but then listen on as to what he goes on to say. He says it implies that the minister has no business trying to guess which unconverted people may or may not be elect, but must press upon all his hearers their duty to turn from sin and trust in God. Now, having said that, uh, he goes on uh, uh, to uh, furthermore comment on Canons 2.5 in this way. He says, here the Canons teach both the redemption of a particular people, and then notice this, and the gospel invitation for all to come to Christ. And having said that, he then proceeds to lend his full support to the well meant offer of the gospel. And this is what he says, and he quotes here 
as you'll see from Canons 3, 4 and Article 8 and 3, 4 and Article 9. Now, I want to draw your attention uh, to something. Those who are observant and uh, know the Canons well uh, will actually see a phraseology here uh, that is probably somewhat foreign to you. Now, the Gospel call, he says, expresses God's sincere invitation for all sinners to come to Christ. And then he says, the canons say, and he quotes, as many as are called by the gospel are unfeignedly called. For God hath most earnestly and truly shown in his word what will be acceptable to him, namely, that those who are called should comply with the invitation. Now, if you're familiar with the canons, and if you were even to look up uh, the canons now, you would see that the English translation of the canons that you utilise do not contain the words should comply with the invitation. And the reason for that is that those words should comply with the invitation are actually in our, are an inaccurate translation of the original Latin. Uh, that's, a, that's a matter that's actually taken up in the work of Homer Huxima, the voice of our fathers. And what's even more interesting is that Dr. Beakey, in his book on Reformed preaching, uh, in the footnotes, acknowledges what Homer Huxima says in the voice of our fathers concerning the inaccuracy of the use of those words should comply with the invitation. And in fact, in the, in the footnote of that book, accepts that the word should really be, should come to him. So the, the uh, article three, uh, rather, head 348, should actually read, uh, for God hath most earnestly and truly shown in his word what will be acceptable to him, namely, that those who are called should come to him. But what's interesting is that when Dr. Beakey actually quotes uh, the canons here in his book, he actually makes reference to the word should comply with the invitation. And as you, can, as you think about that, you can realise that that gives a very different uh, slant on the view that one would have of the call of the gospel. Those words should comply with the invitation uh, do actually appear in English translations of the canon. You'll find them actually in... Philip Scarf's Creeds of Christendom. And they were, that was the English translation that was adopted initially by the Reformed Dutch Church here in America. But it's a translation that's been abandoned by most of the uh, Dutch Reformed churches here. For example, the Christian Reformed Church uh, no longer has that word, those wordings in its translation of the canons and certainly neither does the Protestant Reformed churches. Dr. Beakey, uh, might I suggest, in uh, an illustration of poor, poor scholarship, uh, utilises those words really because it fosters uh, his ideas uh, concerning uh, the invitation or the call of the gospel being an invitation uh, to all sinners. It's of interest to note that though... Dr. Beakey declares that the call of the gospel, as described in Canons 2.5, involves a promise and a command. In his book, he, without explanation or justification, goes on in his commentary to assert that the Canons teach, as I indicated, a gospel invitation for all to come to Jesus Christ. And what I would uh, indi indicate to you is this, the, the terminology, the change in terminology, the change from the description of the call of the gospel as a promise and a command to a gospel invitation is unjustified. What occurs here is there's a change in terminology. What Dr. Beakey had initially described as a command and a promise he recasts as a gospel invitation. 
And he reinforces that view when he goes on to add, the gospel call expresses God's sincere invitation for all sinners to come to Christ. The command and the promise are suddenly and inexplicably transformed into a gospel invitation. And what Dr. Beakey envisages by a gospel invitation becomes evident when he goes on to say this. He says, God personally, earnestly, sincerely and seriously calls all men to come unto him and find salvation by trusting in his Son. A reformed preacher of predestination should offer Christ to everyone who hears the gospel, giving heartfelt calls for them to come to Christ and be saved. Dr. Beakey really repeats those same thoughts in his work titled The Puritan Theology. You notice there that he also appeals again to Canons 3, 4, Articles 8 and 9. It's significant also, before we leave the writings of Dr. Beakey, and I use Dr. Beakey not so much because uh, he is really any different to many others that propound the well may offer the gospel, but he certainly comes from a church that has the three forms of unity as their standards. Uh, it's significant also to note the language that Dr. Beakey employs with respect to the preaching of the gospel and the role of the preacher in relation to the presentation of the well men offer of the gospel. I'd suggest to you that the language that he employs is confusing and internally contradictory. This is what he says, how does the offer of Christ function in experimental preaching? If Christ is the preeminent subject of preaching and his righteousness is at the centre of salvation, we must freely offer his righteousness and this saviour to sinners. We must call and command, that's the language again of the canons, we must call and command men to come to him. But then notice what he goes on to say. We must allure sinners to him by presenting Christ in his beauty, sufficiency and mercy. Now there's no doubt that the gospel ministers need to present Jesus Christ in his beauty, sufficiency and mercy. But is it the calling of gospel ministers, as it were, to allure men and women into the kingdom? That same idea is found also in this following quote taken also from that same book. There Dr. Beakey says, Do not be surprised that there is little exper experiential knowledge in congregations where the ministers do not often preach Christ, but where Christ is faithfully preached and freely offered. You will often find that over a period of time the Spirit cultivates rich Christian experience in those who hear. Thus the Dutch sometimes ask about a minister is he a Christian preacher? They're not asking merely whether he preaches the doctrines of Christ. They are asking, does he offer the riches of Christ and woo sinners to him? There is no more important question, uh, says Dr. Beakey. Again, I draw your attention to the use of the term woo. Is that, is that the nature, the true nature of the call of the gospel? Are ministers engaged in the wooing of sinners into the kingdom? Brethren, there are only a handful of denominations that reject the well meant offer of the gospel. And this does raise the question for those of us who reject the well meant offer of the gospel are our views actually reformed? Are they to be found in the confessional standards? Or somehow have we lost the way? Have we lost the plot? And so the vast majority of the Christian world, the vast majority of the Reformed Church world uh, stands, in, uh, stands in a very different uh, position. But then I want to take us uh, on to uh, look at... Uh, something of what the uh, Synod of Dort had to say uh, concerning uh, 
uh, this issue. It's not surprising that this issue arose at the Synod of Dort, particularly in light of the Remonstrant's universalistic conception of the atonement. The heresies that the Synod condemned uh, did concern uh, these issues concerning the preaching of the gospel. And they really arose out of the Remonstrant's uh, own views of the preaching of the gospel. The Remonstrants had issues uh, with the Reformed uh, or the Calvinist at Dort as regards the preaching of the gospel. Uh, to access those uh, views, uh, one needs to actually turn to what are known as the opinions of the Remonstrants. These were opinions that they formulated and handed in uh, prior uh, to the commencement of the Synod. I think as uh, Professor Dykstra has indicated, there was a great reluctance, though, on their part uh, to do that. Uh, this was the uh, first statement that they made uh, concerning their views as regard the call of the gospel. The remonstrance said, whomever God calls to salvation, he calls seriously, that is, with a sincere and completely unhypocrit unhypocritical intention and will to save, nor do we assent to the opinion of those who hold that God calls ones externally whom he does not will to call internally, that is, as truly converted, even before the grace of calling has been rejected. You see, the remonstrants contended that the Calvinists could not maintain a sincere call of the gospel. Uh, they could not do that on account of their views on predestination and atonement. They maintained that if you held to the doctrine, for example, of reprobation, you could not set forth uh, the call of the gospel, nor could you set forth the call of the gospel sincerely if you maintained a limited atonement. Furthermore, the remonstrants also declared this uh, to the synod. They maintained there is not in God a secret will which so contradicts the will of the same revealed in the word that according to it, that is, the secret will, he does not will the conversion and salvation of the greatest part of those whom he seriously calls and invites by the word of the gospel and by his revealed will. And we do not, as some say, acknowledge in God a holy simulation or a double person. The remonstrance insisted that there was no contradiction or conflict between God's secret and revealed wills. According to both wills, they maintained, he seriously desired and willed the salvation of all men. In their judgment, for God to call men to faith and salvation without a genuine or sincere desire on his part for their salvation would have amounted to a deception on God's part and have revealed him or revealed in him an inconsistent internal duality. What's interesting uh, to note uh, is that there are similarities, strong similarities, uh, between the views of the remonstrants, if you study them, and the views of those who today maintain the well meant offer of the gospel. Could I suggest the following similarities? In the preaching of the gospel, God sincerely offers salvation to every man. The offer of the gospel is a well-meant offer. That's the teaching of the remonstrants. That's the teaching of those who maintain the well-meant offer. Furthermore, the preaching of the gospel, said the remonstrants, was expressive of a genuine desire and intention in God for the salvation of all men. So also say those who maintain the well man offer. Furthermore, the remonstrants maintained the preaching of the gospel was an offer or invitation in the sense that by it, or by means of it, God personally, earnestly, sincerely and seriously called all men to come unto him and to find salvation in him. So also the uh, well man offer proponents. Well, that being the case, what do the canons have to say on the call of the gospel? We've touched on that somewhat already. Uh, the articles, I think, that are of most relevance are 2.5, 3.4.8, 4.8, 4.9, 4.10, 4.11, 4.12, 4.13, 4.14, 4.16, 4.17, 4.18, 4.19, 4.20, 4.21, 4.22, 4.23
and 9. Uh, I begin with Article 2.5 of the Canons. Uh, Moreover, the promise of the Gospel is that whosoever believeth in Christ, rather in Christ crucified, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. This promise, together with the command to repent and believe, ought to be declared and published to all nations and to all persons promiscuously and without distinction, to whom God, out of his good pleasure, sends the gospel. Brethren, Article 2.5 declares that the core of the gospel includes not only a promise, but also a command to repent and believe. And what becomes evident from Article 2.5 is that the call of the gospel at its heart is not an offer. It's not an invitation in the sense of an invitation to treat. It's true that the term offer is actually used in Reformed standards. It's particularly used actually in the Westminster Confessional Standards. But it's not used in the sense of an invitation to treat as it were holding out of something which one can uh, take or reject at one's will. But the, the offer of the gospel is actually a setting forth of the gospel and of the, of, of the way of salvation. That's what the canons teach. The canons teach that the core of the gospel is a command, a command to repent and believe, a command accompanied by the promise, a promise of everlasting life and salvation. And that command, along with the promise, must be preached to all, to all nations, to all persons. No distinction is to be made. The Church of Jesus Christ must preach the gospel wherever the Lord is pleased to open a door. Notice, though, that Article 2.5, despite the assertions and the appeal by the Christian Reformed Church in 1924, uh, Anthony Hookamer, Joel Beakey, despite their appeals, Article 2.4 makes no mention and gives no indication of a desire on the part of God for the salvation of all who come under the preaching of the gospel. The only way you can arrive at that position is by reading that into the text itself. It does not appear on the face of the pages of the canons. Nothing is said about God's intention or desire with respect to the salvation of all who come under the preaching of the gospel. Is God serious about the call of the gospel? Yes, he is absolutely serious about the call of the gospel. Uh, When he says to men and women, repent and believe, he is serious. He calls men to repent and believe on Jesus Christ. But there's not in those words an indication of desire on the part of God for the salvation of all. Just very quickly, Article 3, 4 and 8. As many as are called by the gospel are unfeignedly called, for God hath most earnestly and truly shown in his word what is pleasing to him, namely that those who are called should come to him. He moreover seriously promises eternal life and rest to as many as shall come to him and believe on him. It should be noted that the words unfeignedly, earnestly and seriously in that English translation all derive from the same Latin word. And in fact, one could actually read that uh, article of the canon in this way, as many as are called by the gospel are unfeignedly or seriously called. For God hath most earnestly or seriously and truly shown in his word what is pleasing to him namely that those who are called should come to him. He moreover seriously promises eternal life and rest to as many as shall come to him and believe on him. You notice that the synod there picks up the language of the remonstrance uh, 
with respect to the fact that the call of the gospel was a serious call, but they do not accept the remonstrance requirement for such a call uh, to be based upon a sincere God, desire on the part of God for the salvation of all. And then uh, finally and briefly, Article 3, 4 and 9. It's not the fault of the gospel nor of Christ offered. It's the only place in the canons that you find the reference to the uh, call of the gospel and to it being offered. Uh, it's not the fault of the gospel nor of Christ offered therein, nor of God who calls men by the gospel and confers upon them various gifts that those who are called by the ministry of the word refuse to come and be converted. And there, as is the case also with the references to offer in the Westminster Confessional Standards, the word offer there means to be set forth, uh, to be presented. Uh, it, it, is a, it takes a, a, a serious leap uh, for one to move from that understanding of the canons to the uh, proposition that the offer being spoken of there in Article 349 is in fact an invitation. Nowhere in the canons do you actually find in relation uh, to the uh, subject matter of the offer of the gospel or the subject of the call of the gospel do you find uh, a reference to invitation. The offer of the gospel is not an invitation. As an summation, despite the repeated claims that the canons support the well made offer of the gospel, those claims can't be substantiated. Indeed, not only do the canons not support the well made offer of the gospel, they actually repudiate it. It's evident from the articles of the canons that we've mentioned that the canons teach the following concerning the core of the gospel. The call of the gospel is an unfeigned or serious call to all that hear it. It reflects what God commands and requires of men, namely that men should come to him in repentance and faith in and through Jesus Christ. Furthermore, the canons reflect that the call of the gospel is comprised of a command and a promise. It's not an invitation graciously issued by God to all. The command is to repent and believe and the promise is the promise of everlasting life and rest in and through Jesus Christ. And it's that command, it's that promise that must be proclaimed promiscuously and indiscriminately. But it's also true to say that the canons say nothing, nothing about God's intention or desire with respect to the salvation of all who come under the preaching of of the gospel. Just consider the words of the scripture itself. How does the scripture set forth the call of the gospel? What's the language used by the scriptures? What did John the Baptist say to Israel? He said, repent ye, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's a command, repent ye. That was the same message that the Lord Jesus Christ also delivered. Repent ye, he said, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that's the repeated terminology of the scripture. If you turn to the passage we read in Matthew 22, verse 4, there a command is issued to come to the wedding feast. Uh, likewise, in Luke 14, 17, it's a command. Even in the, a passage such as Matthew 11, 28 through 30, which is often appealed to uh, by those who maintain the well-made offer of the gospel. Come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. They're commands. Now, I'm not saying that we ought not to see in them and to recognise in them the sense of the compassion of the Lord and the, the Lord's... Uh, interest in seeing his people but the context also of Matthew 11 and verse 28 through 30 is, is, is in the context of the fact that God calls a specific people unto himself. Who is it? Ask yourself that. Who is it that labours and are heavy laden? What's the elect of God that are labour, labour and are heavy laden? Uh, who, who is it that uh, desires to take the yoke 
of Jesus Christ upon them. It's the elect of God because of the work of God's grace in their hearts. Rather than the offer of the gospel is taught uh, in the canons. The well men offer the gospel is not reformed. Though much of the reformed church world maintains it today, it is not reformed. It is not in accord with the canons of Dort. To maintain the denial of the well met offer of the gospel it comes at a cost. It comes at a cost for every church that will maintain the truth of the word of God. But by God's grace, brethren, 400 years on from the canons of Dort, uh, let, uh, let you, let those in other churches that maintain uh, the truth of the core of the gospel, let us uphold uh, the teachings of the canon of Dort and the truth that the core of the gospel uh, is not a well-meant offer. Thank you.